taking all your Lucy's down while you, you know, while you upgrade your code and run all your stuff and then start it up again. It's, it's all behind the scenes and seamless. It's, it's just, like I said, I can't believe how much harder it was <laughs> when I reach <laughs> those legacy servers. Now I, I, I get a headache, you know, it's just <laughs> so slick. I mean, everything's yeah, I mean, Welcome back to the show. Today, we're going to be looking at using Content Box in the cloud, and we're going to do some Docker magic with it. And I'm here with Gavin Pickin, and he is a, the software consultant for Audit Solutions, and he's also the guy behind a lot of the Content Box cool stuff. And I think he's been working away on a new release, but we'll ask him about that later in the episode. But first of all, we're going to talk about what Content Box is and why you'd want to use it with Docker. And we'll talk about some of the cool new stuff that he's been putting out with the content box Docker image and using a file mount in order to share media files between multiple instances and how clustering sessions can give you a lot more speed and reliability. We also touch on use of Portainer and Couchbase and Elasticsearch. So lots of cool stuff in today's episode. So welcome, Gavin. Thank you. Appreciate having me. So for those people who don't know, what is Content Box? So Content Box is uh, Order Solutions' very own CMS. So it's a content management system, and we built it on top of Callbox. So it's a Callbox app, um, and it does a lot of the great things you expect from content management systems, and we try to make it bigger and better all the time. Uh, the beauty so of it is, is that it's modular and if you've used command box forge box and everything else just like other cold box apps you can install modules and extend your app in seconds if you wanted to use um, you know bcrypt for your passwords or whatnot just install the module if you want to use um, you know any other modules install them and away you go they're up and running and you can use them in seconds so it, it builds on top of all the the great building blocks that cold box and forge box and command box gives you Great. So it's a cold fusion CMS uh, lets you have your users edit the content without you having to tweak with your code, but you can integrate in other pieces of code from your app into it in cold fusion. Yep. And the reason I love it so much is that even when I'm just thinking about building a normal app, maybe not a blog website or whatnot that most people use content box or CMS service, uh, you can basically build a content, a cold box site with content box, use that for your user administration, your permissions, your roles, and then you just build a normal module and then you can just use those roles. So instead of having to build a whole app, add your users, build your roles and permissions and all the admin interface and everything before you can even start building your app, you just install content box and you build your module because everything else is there. So I don't use anything except content box these days even for the simplest of little apps that i write i install content box and i build my module and that takes care of everything else for me and and how expensive is content box if someone wanted to try it out oh it's really expensive it's free so just it's like everything free. else <laughs> yeah everything else that Audis provides out there we try and give as much open source uh software as we can uh, obviously we have professionally supported our uh, open source software so there are a couple of professional products commercial grade products but most of our stuff out there is free and yeah content box is free you can install it try it out um, and it's easy to get up and running in seconds we have installation on our website to to download it and install it in the existing cold fusion server or instructions how to use it with command box or even if you want to spin it up on docker you can do that too and that can get it up and running in seconds for you so you know, one line is how far away you are from running a content box site. That is. But first, let's ask, why would you even want to run it in the cloud using Docker? Well, the, the more and more I do work with Docker and, and everything like that, we know we've come a long way from uh, using other VMs in, in time. But Docker is just miles and miles better and as we keep developing our our systems too like we're just getting better at designing software and docker is just you know leaks ahead and so going ahead with uh with everything now it's like it's really hard for me to think about why i would not use docker 
And that's sort of the more important question. Uh, you know, setting up a, an old school server these days, you know, setting up Linux just the way you want, setting up all your permissions and everything, creating your sites. And then even when you install your Cold Fusion engine, installing is not easy. You may have a script for it. But then you're going to go through and look at every page in the admin and configure every single setting and everything else. And with Docker and the command box Docker image, it allows you to go in there and just configure everything on the fly. Uh, CF config is a great tool that allows you to export your settings. So maybe you have a, uh, you know, Lucy or Adobe set up, server setup that you like, you can export all those settings out, choose those ones you want. And then when you go to spin up a Docker image, you say, Hey, these are the settings I want. I want this timeout. I want, you know, this is my error page. These are my email server settings. Everything can be pre-done for you and spin it up in seconds. And guess what? If that dies, you spin it up somewhere else. If DigitalOcean goes down, you put it on Amazon. You know, all that information is inside Docker. It's extremely flexible. Move it wherever you want. And then it's easy to scale too. So, I mean, Docker is just great for so many things, local development or in production. I mean, we're using it for a lot of customers and that's the majority of the time we spend these days is working on that. But when we have touch one of those old servers, man, it gives me a headache. <laughs> so it sounds like a good thing to get your command box apps into the cloud using Docker. Um, so let's just talk a little bit more about uh, content box. Um, so you, you said you couldn't extend it Sorry, just cut out there for a second. Yeah, it, it, you can extend uh, Content Box using modules. Is, is that hard, Gavin? Or no, uh, with Autos, you know, we use interception points in Cold Box. So just like jQuery, where you had like an on-click handler or on this, uh, basically, whenever you have those events fire, jQuery would listen for it and do something. And Callbox supports that too. So when you're logging in, for example, say you're going to go onto your login page of your site and someone forgot their password, right? So they click forgot password and it says, hey, put in your email address and we'll email you. Well, what if you don't like that? Maybe you want to add security questions. And so for one of our clients recently, they said, we don't want to have to have them email their, their password or reset password link. We want to be able to have them answer some security questions and do that. So what we did is we just had an inception point, which is on show forgot password. And then what it does is it says, hey, I want to inject this little piece of code right here. And it shows me a link to go to security questions. So now when you go to their site and you click forgot password, it has a button that says, you know, reset password using security questions. You click that, it opens up a module which shows their security questions. They fill them out, they answer it. And all that's done without touching content boxes core code. You didn't have to go in and change the content box login page. You just write a bit of code that says, hey, when the on login box is shown, put this bit of code on there and it does it for you. So interception points make it easy to extend. And like I said, you can even extend the, the objects as well. So you can use CFC inheritance too, where you extend, say, we call the, the users in content box authors because they're authors of content. So if you want to, you can just... Uh, basically go in there and just extend an author and add more security or add something else. So maybe you want to have it where when you give permissions to users, you want to say, Hey, I want them to be an administrator, but they can't delete people. So what you could do is actually have a, a bit of code that runs and you extend the author and you say, when you check permissions, instead of using content boxes, check permissions, use my check permissions. And then my check permissions is, Hey, is Gavin allowed to delete this user? No, he's not. And then if I try and do something else to say, is Gavin allowed to do this? Yes, he is. Okay, let me check content boxes now. So what you did is you just wrap content boxes for check permissions of your own, and you can do what you want. And of course, you can add modules to the admin, add menus and everything in the admin. You can add modules to the front of the site, whatever you want. It's just a cold box app, but you have the option to tie into content box for what you need. So... Now, if you've done all these kind of customizations and, you know, had modules and you release a new version of Content Box, does that break all those customizations? Uh, unless we really mess things up, uh, no, it shouldn't. <laughs> That's the beauty of it. Uh, those inception points won't disappear. Um, you know, those, those inception points will still exist, so that'll still work. Uh, unless we change the author, you know, functionality or something, 
then it should all work. So usually with these type of extensions, there's no issue at all. And actually that leads me to another point. There are a couple of issues that we had some things with content box is way we stored themes and modules and widgets. Previously, in the old school way of doing things, you would install, you know, your download a zip from, from the website and unzip it. And then you'd put everything inside your, your code. And so inside the content box module, we would have our themes and our modules and our widgets. Now, if you're using command box and you want to upgrade your content box server, you just do install content box dash dash force and basically, okay, override that module. But now your themes and your widgets and everything that were in there, they might get knocked out. So in content box 3.8, the new version we're about to release any day now, hopefully any day now, um, the time you listen to this, it should be out, has a, a new convention for custom content box content. So you'll have a new place to put your themes and your modules and your widgets and everything, which is basically upgrade proof. So when you go and upgrade your, your site, you don't have to worry about, is that going to affect any of my themes or whatnot? Cause that module is completely removed and that made it smoother for the Docker installs and everything else. So just like everything else we do, our day to day work for our clients help us improve these products. And so we've improved command box and content box. And this is something we're doing for those processes there. So, um, Update, yeah, what, upgrade proof. Yeah, what, what, what other things are exciting about version 3.8 that's coming out? Um, the, a lot of little stuff to do with, um, you know, just small bug fixes that people have found and everything else. But the, the big thing really is just making content box more flexible to allow, like, the, the addition of themes in different locations and widgets and really making it, um, you know, like, say, sort of install friendly, Docker friendly, and just give you a central location for all your content. And, you know, as a developer, it wasn't fun sometimes for me to go into modules and content box and then look for the themes and the, that location. Now everything's at a higher level. So it's just easy to click into and get to all my stuff is easily contained too. So, you know, I can just copy that folder into another content box site. You know, if I want to just copy a theme, it's easy just to grab it and move it. It's just higher up in the tree, but most of the stuff is all about um, just little fixes like that. And a lot of, a lot of changes to do with making it more Docker friendly as we go, you know, said we're using it more and more and we come up with these little issues. So we work through them and when we release it, we'll have the release notes, which have, you know, all the little bug fixes and improvements we've made. So got to get a hold of that. But those are the big things really. It's just, you know, it's not a, not a 4.0 release yet. So if you guys are waiting for 4.0, maybe you'll see that into the box coming up here at the end of April. Maybe not. You'll have to come and find out. So <laughs> we're keeping and, the big things for that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so there's some exciting new stuff for version four that's uh, coming out in a few months time. Yep. That's uh, it's on the road roadmap right now. We're, we're hoping to get a few more big items in. We've, we've talked about them over time, but uh, we're staying real busy with, uh, you know, auto solutions is doing a lot of client work, a lot of legacy conversion, a lot of people converting older blogs over to content box, a lot of things moving people into Docker and the cloud. And that's what we're doing a lot of these days. And that's why this talk is so important because, you know, I spend a couple of hours on Slack most days talking to people about different options on, you know, how to deploy your servers and how you should deal with file mounts and this and that. So, you know, this, this, be a nice little session, I think, and we'll probably come away with more questions and answers for people, but that's okay. We're, we're on Slack. We're on the CFML Slack group, our order Slack group, um, you know, available through Google groups and everything else. But I, I think it's just, you know, a big step forward. So, yeah, um, we talked about the uh, roadmap uh, in an episode uh, last year. So I'll, I'll link in that for people interested in what the roadmap is. Yeah, a lot of it comes down to making it more API friendly. There's some built-in APIs and content box which make it easy to get into data. So if you hit, you know, certain URLs and content box, you can get all the page data back for a page or the category list or or whatnot. So we're we're making it more friendly where there's, you know, going to be API tokens for users, so you can actually hit the API and be secured. That way, we know that you're actually a legitimate user trying to access the site, so it can secure it somewhat. Um, and then we're looking at custom content types, where you can build your own CRUD interface based on your content type. So there's lots of little things like that. I'm not sure what's going to make the cut in version four, but we've got lots of good ideas, probably through to version five, six, and seven. But we you know we keep adding them, and as we get to a client that needs something, then we're like, okay, let's time to build this module and 
So we're, we're doing that all the time. So as we develop them out and get them tested, then we put them in there. So you, you made a, a new image uh, for Content Box to load in Docker. T tell us about that and what's special about it. Yeah, um, I won't take credit for it completely because, um, you know, John and Brad do a lot more of that. John Clawson and Brad Wood spend a lot of time working in uh, our Docker images and command box stuff. But they took the command box image, which is basically a vanilla image that allows you to run any jar file, any version of Cold Fusion, Lucy, Raylo, and get it up and running in Docker. But with Content Box, as I mentioned before, we have all those custom locations for the themes and widgets and modules and everything else. So if you want to map those in, um, you know, so you can have them file mounted so they persist across different engines and you can share them between nodes, then, you know, those are very important. So they added support for that. We added a lot more environment support as well. So if you wanted to, you know, pass in certain environment variables into the the Docker image, it'll support that as well. So you can actually pass in settings. So if you want to override the setting for this image to maybe use a different file location for the, the media mount versus the built-in one in the database, you can pass in on-the-fly settings and everything. So it's got a few extra goodies like that, and we'll find out more during the session. But, you know, it's been upgraded to be content box specific, where command boxes image is really, you know, for any CFML app or even just any jar, you can deploy other jars through it too. You could do, you know, deploy Jenkins and whatnot on top of command box too. So... Now, you, you mentioned file mounts there. Why would you want to use that in, in a content box app? Well, obviously with content box, uh, it's a CMS and people are going to be uploading blog posts. They're going to have photos and images and maybe a photo gallery or, or whatnot, slides for the slideshow on the homepage. And so you need somewhere to put those. And now with Docker, the way you have to think about it, and this is a big change with Docker, is that instead of having one site, one folder that lives on forever, you've basically got, your blueprint for how the site should work. And then you've got other pieces that need to live on. So you've got the data in the database, and then we've got some files which live in a media store uh, that we call it the contents, like the media manager, a part of the content box. And those sort of two things live on. So if you killed your site and spun it up on a new server, you'd basically link up the database again, and then you would link up that folder again. And so if you have it on four different nodes for example four different items in the cluster the blueprint would be on all four and then they would point to this one database and then it would point to one file mount that allows you to share those images across all the images all of them and that way if some one of the docker nodes explodes like docker should be able to if it blows up you have three others and it still keeps working now in the old way if you had it in your file system and you upload it into your site and that server went down you'd lose those files um, and clustering them was kind of a pain and everything else. So you will have to think about that with your app, you know, not just content box apps, but other apps. You need some central location for things to make it easy to, to keep those files alive. But file mounts and Docker make it easy to, to share them between, you know, multiple uh, node instances and away you go. And then how do you, if that's a single file mount that's shared between all the instances in the cluster, how do you protect that from the file mount having issues? Do you, you back it up or what's the... Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, always back up everything. Uh, you don't usually have to back up your, your sites these days because if they're just blueprints you just download from your source control and you know do a box install and an NPM install and away you go again. But, um, but yeah, for most things like that, have a good backup and then usually you have snapshots, you could replace them with a snapshot of it. So floating IPs and everything is good for your servers, but um, the good thing with volume mounts, things like DigitalOcean, you just spin up a new mount, restore the backup, and away you go. And those are usually, you know, if you're using something like DigitalOcean or Amazon, uh, AWS, et cetera, those are usually super, you know, reliable. They're, they do go down, but, um, you know, they're fault tolerant region, you know, you could set it up to however you want. So it could be stored in multiple regions, et cetera. So um, they're, they're built to, to work that way. They're built like a CDN. So you won't have those, the same issues. 
like I said, it's possible. Things can happen. Amazon went down for whatever, what was it, four hours that one day and the world ended. Um, <laughs> but usually they're fine. So um, those file mounts are, you know, going to be way more secure and way more uh, resilient than you're, what you're used to. So. Okay. So why would you want to, to cluster your content box site? What's the benefit of doing that? Well, the big thing with Docker is, first of all, you're isolating this one site from other sites. So that's a big thing before you even cluster. Just having its own Docker instance means that if you've got a big beast of a site that all of a sudden, you know, decides to update 300,000 records at once, that it's not going to take down your site too. Um, You know, the hardware and everything is all virtually separate um, through the VM, through Docker. And so everything there is going to be separate and protected. But then once you've done that, and you have it protected from other instances, you can spin up more than one to, to save yourself some, some, some battles, basically. So just like you would in the old days with clustering a server, so uh, you know if one is busy, you've got another server, it allows you to horizontally scale instead of just getting a vertical scale where basically you add more CPUs and more RAM to it. With clustering, you just give it more servers and say, hey, these are, this is where my swarm is. And the beauty with Docker Swarm is Docker Swarm says, hey, they want, want to view my website. Which one should I send it to? And it figures out, oh, we've got three up right now. I'll send it to those three. And then if you're in a busy time of the year or something, you could spin up a few more. I know some people have maybe five sites on their uh, really busy times. And when they hit their super peak, they up, update from five to 15 or 20 instances on their servers. And they can just do that by, you know, just spinning up more and Docker Swarm knows where it's going and it handles that. So, um, I mean, and, and either you could do that, traffic. you could either do that manually or you could automate the scaling based on the traffic. Yeah. Um, things like Kubernetes have built in uh, auto scaling based on, on different settings. Um, Docker Swarm, didn't have that last I looked. I know they're always announcing new features and I'm sure that's coming soon. But right now with Docker Swarm, you have to tell it when to up it basically. So you can get uh, alerts saying, hey, I've got so much traffic on my instances and it could give you a notification and you could just run a job that says, hey, spin me up two more or whatnot. But um, yeah, as of yet, Docker Swarm doesn't auto scale. But it is it is a nice thing. That's one of the main reasons people like things like Kubernetes, which is another option for orchestration if you're not using Docker Swarm. Well, I you know maybe uh, Portana will add uh, that in the future. You never know. <laughs> yeah, Portana is a great tool. We use it all the time. Uh, I'll be using it in my presentation as well, showing you how that works. It gives a really nice UI to those who are not comfortable with command line. Because Docker, you can get all the information you need from the command line, but it's nice to be able to pull up Portana and look at your instances, see which where they're spread out. Maybe you've got you know three, three little. CF apps running on one server and two on another. You can see that visually. You can click into them to see what environment variables they're using and, and whatnot. It's it's a great little tool. We use it at Autist. Uh, I recommend using it even on your local dev just to see what's running on your machine when you're getting started. It's it's really invaluable and it's open source. And uh, we're lucky to have a, a relationship with Paul Tano. We've, we've talked to the people there. They're great guys and they're adding more support for things as we go through. And they seem like they're, you know, good people going the right way. So we definitely want to, you know, help support them. And we're, we've been talking to them about doing uh, presentations. Uh, Autist Developer Week last year, I thought we had someone from Portena come and speak. Um, and, you know, those are valuable, valuable sessions. And um, we're trying to do more with them, you know, reaching out to, to other open source companies as well. That's great. Yeah, I mean, I was talking to uh, the co-founder, Neil Creswell of Portena on the podcast, and I'll link in his interview uh, in the show notes. Okay, um, but lots of exciting new features there. And I was just amazed. I mean, I think he said there are 250 million downloads of Portena. So that's a I'm lot of websites <laughs> being uh, run uh, through Docker or using Portena. And um, yeah, I don't know how many of those those 250 million are running content box, but probably a few. <laughs> yeah, a few, but uh, I mean, it's, it's great software. So I'll definitely show everyone how to use that and run it. And I mean, it's, it's definitely great for working through things. So, 
Now, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, the, the file mount. What about the database? Is there anything you can do there uh, to improve performance? Or Yeah, I mean, you're always going to have a bottleneck somewhere. One way or the other, you're going to find a bottleneck. Um, if you're working off somewhere like AWS or Google Cloud Platform, um, you know, using their database solutions, just like the file mounts and everything, they're set up to be resilient. They're set up to be scaled. They're set up to be, you know, ideal. If you're running your own, um, obviously databases, we don't recommend running in, in Docker right now. It's the, the conceived notion that it's better to have their own, you know, dedicated um, VM basically. So, but yeah, I mean, you can look at clustering them and depending which database server you're running. Um, you can definitely do that. We have clients running on AWS and they're using their the AWS RDS stuff and they're loving it. It's working great. And we have some customers that are using AWS's database across the cloud to their stuff, which I was surprised worked so quick. So I guess AWS has some pretty low latency and they're able to do that. But um, but yeah, I mean, you can definitely look at clustering. Um, you know, but again, with these days with the this quickness that you can spin up a new server. You can go to DigitalOcean, spin up a server, restore from a backup, um, mount your drive, add your floating IP, and it's back up in seconds. It's crazy how fast everything is these days. So, you know, those those file mounts that store your data, the floating IP, obviously is how you move your IP. So if the database server goes bad, you zap it, spin up a new one, add the file mount, add the IP, and away you go. It's... It's kind of crazy, but the world we live in. <laughs> but yeah, if you're, you if you're working off somewhere with the database um, options like Google Cloud and AWS, that's the better way to go. So mm. uh, they're, they're built to be clustered automatically. They're behind the scenes. They're clustered. They're horizontally and vertically scaled. You know, they're, they're just perfect, perfect world. We just don't all live in that world. So, <laughs> um, What about uh, caching? How does that work with content box yeah well that's the big thing with um other than your media is your session so obviously you could run content box on multiple ser servers and that'll work fine but your sessions you need some way to link those sessions together so when someone hits one box or the other it doesn't actually you know log them out because oh you don't have a session on this server and do something about that so uh we use Couchbase or Redis with that. Um, Redis, we have a nice little script that you can spin up a Redis server uh, on the fly uh, in Docker. But Couchbase is a, the our caching uh, engine that we use most of the time. Uh, we have extensions for Lucy to have Redis and Couchbase natively, natively supported in Lucy with the Couchbase extension. Um, and they are two of our commercial products but they work great and that allows us to basically you know use out use that cache for our session storage so across um you know across servers instances it all thinks it's one big content box site so you can have 10 20 content box instances spinning up on a docker swarm and it all thinks it's one big app so uh, they work great for that they're lightning quick redis is really popular uh, and it's you know great in memory cache and it's perfect for this what what about uh free text search because often people have all kinds of content and they want to be able to search for it does it support that or well i mean usually for that we're, we've been working with elastic search and um behind elastic search is leucine engine and that's been running the stuff uh and cf search for quite a while now uh, that's in lucy they use that behind the scenes for cf search and before solar um leucine was inside the adobe cf as well so I found out today I've been using Lucene and uh, the, the engine behind Elasticsearch for quite a while. I just didn't know it. Um, but, but yeah, uh, Elasticsearch is a way we lean for anything like that. Uh, we've got some pretty um, big traffic travel sites. And right now it's uh, everyone's getting their money from taxes back unless you're a freelancer uh, and everyone's, you know, planning their summer vacations and spending a lot of money on, on travel. And uh, we're working with a couple of travel agents, right now and these big companies they have a lot of traffic and their searches have to be lightning quick if you're not quick enough someone will go elsewhere and so we're using elastic search to power that and it's it's lightning fast and so elastic search is is great for that and again you just spin up a container or two inside docker um you know you have all your index data and everything and use json to query it and 
comes back in JSON, lightning fast, then you can plug it into your Cold Fusion or your JavaScript front end and away you go. So, so on, on some of these high traffic sites that are running uh, through Content Box, how, how many Docker containers do you have to have to support that volume of traffic? Well, I mean, it really depends. I mean, right now for most of our sites, uh, even for some of our clients, we're running, you know, two, three, four. I mean, you probably could run more, um, but uh, we have a decent size, um, you know, Docker instance for them. We usually run Lucy with, you know, two or four gigs of RAM. And that way they've got plenty of juice. And, you know, usually that's enough. But like I said, if something happens and they need more, they can just throw a couple more at it. And, you know, that's that's the beauty of Docker, right? So if you you got three servers today and you need 10 tomorrow, you can do that. So... And you don't have to install all those servers and set up the configuration. You're just copying the script that you did for the first servers and it's up in a few seconds. Yeah, I mean, basically uh, we use continuous integration for everything. So when you push your code to development branch, uh, we're using GitLab a lot because of the built-in Docker support and the built-in Docker registry. It's really slick. So you have this build script running and it's going to go and take the... uh, take your dev files it's going to pull them down it's going to run your build script your docker files and we you know we do npm installs and run any gulp um, functions we need or anything like that and basically once it's all done we run our test make sure our test pass once that's done and it, it passed then we wrap it up into a docker image then we upload it to the docker registry or behind the scenes and then Basically, from there, we push that out to our Docker Swarm. We can push it out to the staging swarm and make sure everything's working fine and everything. And once they're happy with that, then they can push a button to merge from dev to staging. I mean, dev to production, sorry. Uh, and once it's in that, that master branch, it does a build without all the testing because you've already tested it. Does all that building and everything and then pushes it out to the swarm. And then Docker Swarm is smart enough to spin up the new one. Spins one new one up spins another new one up and then it starts taking down the old ones and that way you're slowly you know switching them out there's no big you know halt and there's no you know 10 10 minutes of taking all your lucy's down while you you know while you upgrade your code and run all your stuff and then start it up again it's it's all behind the scenes and seamless it's it's just like I said, I can't believe how much harder it was <laughs> when I reach <laughs> those legacy servers. Now I, I, I get a headache, you know, that's just <laughs> so slick. I mean, everything's yeah, I mean, for you. yeah. And, and that's not just for code changes. I mean, if you wanted to upgrade to a newer version of Lucy or, or any other config change, you, the same kind of process can be applied. Yeah, exactly. That's the beauty. We're based off the command box server. You just change your box.json, you know, or your server.json. And so you go to the server.json and say, hey, I want Lucy 5.2.6 right now. And you're like, oh, you know what? There's a new version of um, this module. And so maybe I want to use, you know, version 1.2 instead of 1.1. You could change your box.json. You push the box.json through your source control and then it'll start the build process and it'll test it and make sure it all worked. If something breaks, it's going to tell you, Hey, that module's not working. <laughs> and then, you know, it doesn't get pushed out. You tell, cause you report that it failed and you can go and, you know, take care of it. So, I mean, and the thing is you don't have to worry about installing that, that module and, you know, and then pushing that module into source control with command box and forge box. It's just a version number. And then when you go to install it, that's when all the work happens. So you're not having to worry about, you know, big chunks of code in your source control. It's just what you need in your source control. So, well, just... yeah. So I, I, this content box with Docker is very exciting and all the other box things make it really easy to, to scale and uh, have a reliable content site. So uh, great stuff you're doing there, Gavin. Um, so let's talk a bit about some other topics now, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, which is the first one is why are you, why are you proud to use Cold Fusion? Well, I've been using Cold Fusion a long time. Um, I did actually use uh, ASP and PHP for a while, um, just while I was at college. Um, I got, you know, there were some classes at school. I was, I was doing Java and Pascal and Turbo Pascal and, you know, ASP.net or yeah, I guess classic ASP as they call it now was around and PHP was as well. And I got the chance to work for the university of Auckland 
and we're we basically formed the first e-business team and our, all our managers went to this big cold fusion training and they came back with these big old manuals, the three day boot camp, or it might even mean the five day. They came back and said, this is amazing. We're going to use it. And they threw the binder on the desk and said, go learn it guys. And so that weekend I went home and came back and I was already writing. I wrote my first little module. I wrote a you know, news module, did the crud for it, listed it, you know, did, did all that work and it was easy after working with php and asp it was like it was just a, such a bliss <laughs> it was so easy so quick you know everything just made sense you know there was actual error messages that i could see and use to fix things and like php's white page of nothing um and so it was just it was just great and then from there and I've been working with it ever since, worked for, you know, a few companies before I came to the Audis and, you know, done a lot of great things for a lot of great companies. And yeah, I, I love it. I mean, there's other languages out there that might have some nice features, but, you know, it, Cold Fusion does everything I wanted it to do. I do it well. Uh, I've met a lot of great people with it and, you know, it's still doing the job for people. It's, you know, now with Lucy too, of the open source option, it's way more uh, as an option for people as, you know, budgets coming in more into play and Docker and Docker licensing. I mean, it's got a lot of great things going for it. And I mean, I love showing it off. I love showing off like command box to people because that type of stuff, like the ability to write your own CLI commands and everything is pretty cool. And I don't know too many other languages that can do that. So I like to show it off and see if people can even guess what language it's written in. So <laughs> That is so cool. So, you know, with here at the CF Live podcast, we're working on making Cold Fusion more alive and, um, you know, letting people know it's a modern language, which is what you you guys at Wartis uh, are all doing with Content Box and all the other box products. But my question for you is what would it take to make cold fusion even more alive this year? That's a tough question. I mean, really for languages to get popular, we really need some killer apps, you know, like PHP has been around forever, but nobody really gave a crap <laughs> until <laughs> WordPress came out. You know, I mean, a lot of these big languages or whatnot that get their attention, it's because there's a big app that everyone's using, or there's a big site that everyone knows about. They think is awesome that's using it you know so i know twitter was using you know certain languages at certain times and when they changed languages that they got bad raps for for using them you know but it's it's certain technologies that certain cool hip companies get that make them look cool i mean there's no one that's out there using you know cold fusion for a big company or you know there's no one out there with that killer app like wordpress or whatnot that's taking the world by storm and that's why no one knows about it so that's really the big challenge i think is if we could get some big company or whatnot to be using it and people know that they're using it but i mean that's that's not easy to do but that's what i think it would really take to really make it like get back on the scene is like hey this is hip and cool we're using command box package management because when i tell people that we have package management and clis and and all of that people are like really and i'm like yeah we have scripts and we can do this we can do that and they're like you have member functions too and i know that brad and then when they go to dev uh, the dev nexus and they're talking to java developers Java developers are blown away by all the stuff that we can do that they just can't do. They got to do boilerplate and everything. So it's just, you know, it's all about getting the word out there and without that killer app or that killer site using it, I think we're, you know, it's always going to be an uphill battle. So you're going to into the box and I think you're speaking several times into the box, four times. Aren't you doing a, a workshop and you're, part of the keynote and you're doing two sessions yourself and... yep i'm definitely busy um yeah um we're doing the workshop uh, cold box zero to hero and we've actually sold out that workshop so that's the first workshop this year to be sold out me and eric peterson are going to be presenting on that one so that's great and yeah i will be speaking at the keynote as well talking about content box and some of the other uh the other items that i i work on at water solutions and then I have two sessions. One of them is Content Box and Docker, which we've been talking about today. But I'm also speaking about Alexa with Coldbox REST APIs too. So I think that it's a, an interesting topic. It's something fun for us geeky Cold Fusion is out there to play with. And you know, I want to show people that you can play with Alexa and you know use your Coldbox REST API and be able to 
do some cool stuff with that. So that's what my session is on. So um, I've been working on that recently, just trying to get it all polished up to, to try and wow you guys and show you some cool stuff. Sounds exciting. So what are you looking forward to at this year's Into the Box, Gammon? Well, I've got a lot of friends that uh, will be there. Obviously, the oldest team is a, we're like a family. It's, it's a great little team that we have. And, uh, you know, I always enjoy time with the team. But there's a lot of great people that have made it at this conference and a lot of other conferences, too. Um, I know that there's a, a first-time speaker into the box, Jeff, Jeff Punkel. I think you interviewed him already. And uh, he's um, – I met him at CF Objective and Dev Objective the last couple of years. He's a really good guy, and we're happy to have him come speak there. But um, there's a lot of other great people that we've met over the years at different conferences, and they'll all be there. So I'm really looking forward to to meeting some of them there, uh, especially the, some of the speakers you know I've got to know over time as well. Um, so that's usually the best thing is just really catching up with everybody, you know, friends new and old. Um, but that's the that's the big thing for me obviously there's always great content it's always inspiring you know you get get really passionate about everything and you come back wanting to do more bigger better things um but you know it comes down to it the the people the people's what make these conferences worth going to you know yeah i mean i was there last year it was a great event uh very friendly uh, lots of great technical content and lots of cool conversations in the corridor as well so yeah, that's and one of the mariachi that, band as well. <laughs> yeah, happy box is always a highlight. It's it's a lot of great fun. But uh, yeah, that's what I like about Into the Box. I mean, it's not a big conference, um, but a couple of people that came there um, last year they were really surprised because you know they they were amazed how intimate it was. You know, like we've got enough people that it's a good popular conference, but not too many where this you know, you sort of see people flying by and never have time to talk. So it's one of those conferences that, you know, you run into people, uh, you know, a few times, there's always time to talk to everybody you want to talk to. And, you know, obviously I'm an oldest guy, but a lot of people said it was great that they could sit down and talk to each of us and pick our brains about different things and, you know, give us their two cents on what we should do and shouldn't do. And, you know, it's good to have that sort of intimacy. And so, you know, a few people last year talked about it being one of the best cold fusion conferences I've ever been to, you know, and Jim Pickering uh, has been saying some great things on Twitter about us lately. And Nolan Irk, who's speaking it, uh, again into the box this year. Um, he's, he's, he was he said, yeah, it's the best cold fusion conference I've been to in a long time. And he's been to a lot of conferences. He speaks at CF Summit, CF Objective and, and some other non cold fusion conferences too. And I mean, he really enjoyed it. So, I mean, I, I think it's a real step up and like I said, it's just the right size. I think the good amount of content and I say great people, you know, we've got a lot of people cold box and non box. It doesn't have to be a box person to enjoy into the box too. There's a lot of great stuff there that you'll get out of it without having to be a box fanboy. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It's not just uh, box stuff. There's plenty of cold fusion topics and other developer (laughs) topics. So, um, you know, I was talking with Jeffrey just before I interviewed you and he's talking about dealing with anxiety in development, uh, and, uh, you know, that's the thing that a lot of, uh, cold fusion developers, uh, have stress and, uh, imposter syndrome and various other things. So, yeah, but it's important to look after all aspects of us. I mean, not just our coding mind, but yeah. yep. Um, the soft skills and, and dealing with, yeah, a lot of the other aspects is very important. And I'm, I'm interested in that topic too. So, uh, definitely be good to, to see. Cool. So what other Cold Fusion conferences are you speaking at this year? Well, I'm hoping to be speaking at CF Summit again if they pick me. The speaker deadline is coming up here. I think April 15th is the, the deadline for CF Summit, um, the one in Vegas. So this year it's going to be in October, a little earlier than last year. But I spoke there the last few years, and uh, it's been it's been a lot of fun. So I'm going to be there. Um, I was hoping to get to CF Objective again this year. I've spoke there the last five years. I've been there the last six years, but they're on hiatus this year. So I'm hoping that a lot of the guys that we usually run into at CF Objective will make the the trip down to Texas and join us into the box since CF Objective is not going to be happening this year. Um, I am going to be going to Muricon, I think, at this point, if my schedule stays the way it is. Um, They're up in Sacramento in California in early April, so I'm actually hoping to get up there and uh, you know, obviously 
Mira has uh, competed at a content box. I'm not just going there to steal ideas and everything else, but to see, you know, what they're doing. And they got a lot of, you know, good client projects too and see what companies are doing with it and everything. It's just good to keep up with, with everything going on there. And so that's happening. I've never been to Miracon, so I'm kind of excited about that. And uh, another one that I've never been to is NC DevCon. Um, I'm, I'm hoping to get out to, to there this year, just waiting on those dates to see if, uh, if they're going to have it um, in the same time frame in September. Um, and then obviously CF camp in Europe would be beautiful. I'd love to get there. So if I can make it work with my wife, then uh, we'll try and take a little trip to Italy afterwards and everything. But if I'm not there, Brad and Lewis or, you know, man, the man, the oldest test there with Jorge. Um, so there's a few there that I'd like to get to, but uh, Autos Developer Week, our online conference, I'm pretty sure I'll make that one since I can do that from the comfort of my own home. And, uh, and yeah, the beauty with Autos is we try and, you know, offer a lot of content throughout the year. So if you guys can't make conferences, we try and offer these uh, road shows, what we call them. We basically offer a, a weekly seminar for one month on a dedicated topic. So last year we had one on, on containers, we had one on rest, we had one on content box. And so I'm hoping that uh, we get some more people out there. But um, like I said, CF Summit um, will be big, and I'll be there in Vegas whether I'm speaking or not. So if you guys can't make it into the box, you better make it to CF Summit so we can catch up. I say I like to meet all my all the friends and you know meet over time in the CFML community. Yeah, I was talking with uh, Alicia from Adobe about CF Summit, and uh, I, I think they just announced a super early bird ninety nine dollar special on CF Summit West. So yeah, um, uh, that's, that's what I'm saying. I forget the expiration date, but it's only a, yeah, yeah, it's I mean, only a few weeks you can get that price. So uh, yeah, and that's the thing. It's like whether I'm speaking or not, that's a good deal, you know. So, <laughs> yeah. and that's one of the ones that I can actually drive to. So I like that as well. So we can get out there and. See the sites. We had a lot of fun last year. Me and Tony, Tony Junkers and uh, Andrew Davis. We had fun. We went and ate some Brazilian food and went to Top Golf and we had a lot of fun. You know, and of course, there's always good content there too. So, great. So, if people want to find you online, what are the best ways to do that, Gavin? Well, like I said, I am on the CFML Slack. Um, G Pickin is where you find me most places. So on the CFML Slack, on the Box Team Slack, and then Twitter, I'm at G Pickin. On my, I have a blog, gpickin.com. But you also find me writing some blogs on autosolutions.com as well. Um, so if you don't see too many posts on my G Pickin, it's probably because I'm too busy blogging at autosolutions.com. Um, <laughs> but those are the best ways to get a hold of me. Um, so yeah, so if you guys got any questions, I should reach out. Um, Twitter is a good way to get in touch, or just jump on Slack. You know, we can have a little chat and see how we can, you know, catch up. Great. Well, thanks for coming on the show today. Yeah, no problem. I'm much appreciated. Thanks for having me, and uh, thanks for helping share the word about Into the Box. It's going to be a lot of fun this year, and uh, it'll be good to see everybody. So get your tickets. Don't miss out on the other workshops. <laughs>